Well, thank you for joining us for tonight's webinar. I believe there is a hero in all of us, superheroes and risk-taking behavior in young children. I'm Greg Berry, Director of Communications in the Office of Alumni Affairs. Since we're coming to you virtually, please excuse technical issues or glitches that may pop up. If you experience problems with your video or audio, click the reconnect button on your screen to get back to the webinar right away. A quick note, we are recording tonight's webinar or replay will be made available on our website tomorrow. Tonight, we welcome Dr. David Schwabel and Casey Martin. Dr. Schwabel is a university professor of psychology and associate vice president for research facilities and infrastructure here at UAB. He obtained his Bachelor of Arts from Yale before earning his master's and PhD from the University of Iowa. Casey is currently a fifth year PhD student in UAB's medical and clinical psychology program where she's completing a one year clinical internship prior to graduating with her doctorate. Prior to UAB, she got her Bachelor of Science degree from Loyola University. At this time, I would like to formally welcome Dr. Schwabel and Casey Martin to our webinar series. So happy to have you on this Tuesday night. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thanks, Greg. And it's great to talk to a group of, of Blazer alumni uh, throughout Alabama and the country. Um, so uh, our plan today is to tell you a bit about superheroes and risk-taking, risk-taking that leads to injuries in children. And uh, Casey will uh, be discussing most of that research because it's her uh, master's in dissertation research. It's her doctoral research here at UAB. I'm going to get us started by telling you a little bit about my expertise, which is in child injury. So I'll tell you a little bit about uh, the epidemiology of injury, how often it happens, uh, the risk factors for injury, and, the, and some prevention strategies that we've studied here in our laboratory at UAB. And then I'll turn it over to Casey, who will, who will cover um, her research to giving you some background on superheroes and the media uh, that, that presents superheroes, uh, short and long-term exposure to superhero media in children, and some future directions of the research. So let me start by presenting what most of you will say is obvious, which is that accidents, accidental injuries, as we call them in everyday language, really are not entirely accidental. There are ways we can prevent them. And as psychologists, we think about accidents, we think about injuries, and we think about how we can prevent those using behavioral strategies. Injuries cause more deaths to children here in the United States than the next 10 leading causes of deaths combined. So this is a significant problem. This is the leading child public health problem in our country. And it's actually a global health problem. And I've, I've put two pictures in here of some of our global research. On top, you have a classroom in China, and that's a group of children who are learning to cross the street in a virtual world. We, we created a virtual environment for the children to cross the street, and, and they were practicing crossing the street in this virtual environment in their Chinese city. On the bottom is a community in Cape Town, South Africa, where we were working to improve kerosene safety. Uh, as you might guess, kerosene is, is hazardous to children. It's poisonous. Uh, and so there's a lot of children that poison themselves from, from kerosene, as well as highly flammable. And so you have fires. And so we worked in this community in Cape Town to reduce kerosene related injury. Uh, injury is becoming not just a problem in the United States, but a global health problem. And, and I think you'll hear about superheroes focused on the United States, but in many ways a global challenge as well. So what causes children to get accidentally hurt? Well, we know of course that age, gender, and culture play a role. And age is driven by children's development. So you see on top of the top photo here, a child, a, a young girl reaching for, for what might be poisons in, in her uh, parents' cabinet, this is a risk for young children, right? Two, three-year-olds see something appealing, they want to drink it, and they might grab it and drink it. Our older children, for example, on the bottom, these children may be seven, eight years old, they're not likely to reach for poisons. Instead, they get hurt in other ways, right? So they might get hurt playing soccer, uh, playing sports. They may get hurt crossing the street. Um, and so with different age groups, you've got different capacities of the children and different risks that they might take. Our superhero research, as you'll hear, is focused on those young children. And, and so how do, how do superheroes affect the behavior of children who are quite young and still have a, a, a early brain development as far as their cognitive development? We also have parent factors, of course. How well do parents supervise the children? How well do they uh, have resources in the home to protect the home from, from injury? 
Um, and we have environmental factors. You have the, the, the risks in the home, our stair gates used, our, our outlet plugs used. You've got risks in the roadways. Do we have crosswalks? Do we have uh, ways for children to get to school that are safe? And then of course, we've got their environment, which includes the toys and, and the things in the home, as well as the media they're exposed to. And we'll come back to that topic, of course, how does that media, how do those superhero media exposures affect children's risks? So before I turn it over to Casey, I'll show you a few of the examples of, of prevention that we've uh, developed in our laboratory um, at UAB. So on the left is, is a child learning to cross the street at uh, Hemp Hill Elementary School in, in West Birmingham. Uh, as you can see, the child is uh, immersed, semi-immersed into a simulated environment, steps down off that curb, which helps the child learn to cross the street safely. Uh, we've used that successfully across Birmingham uh, and are continuing to study that in our laboratory now. In the middle picture is a book I recently published, Raising Kids Who Choose Safety. So this is a prevention strategy for parents. Uh, a popular book readily available on Amazon, How Do We Reach Parents? help them learn what they can do to help their children choose safer decisions. Uh, it introduces something called the TAMS method, teach, act, model, and shape, which helps uh, parents understand how to best uh, keep their children safe from injuries. On the top right, you have uh, uh, actually a, a clip from a video that, that is part of our Shoot Safe Firearm Safety Program. So we've developed Shoot Safe, which is a web-based program to teach 10 to 12 year olds to use firearms in a safe way. Uh, this is, um, I recognized a politically complicated issue, but we know that children across the United States use firearms and we feel by age 10, if parents want them to use firearms in a safe way to go hunting or shooting, that we can teach them to do it safely. And on the bottom right is, is uh, part of our poisoning research. So some of you might recognize the bottle on the left is tiki torch fuel used in your backyard to, to kind of um, keep mosquitoes away. The bottle on the left uh, is about eight or 10 years old now. Uh, and I was um, asked actually by an attorney to study that bottle uh, after very sadly some, some children died uh, from poisoning from that bottle. And um, there was a lot of questioning over, are these bottles similar to juice? Do children look at this and think that might be juice and drink it? So we conducted research, we found yes, children do tend to look at that bottle as something that might be juice. Uh, after lawsuits and our research was published, uh, the Tiki uh, Torch Company and other companies now uh, sell and market the bottle on the right. Um, and so that's an example of an environmental change that likely has reduced child injuries and deaths. So I'll be happy to answer questions about some of those topics at the end, but our topic for today, our focus is on superheroes. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Casey who will tell you a bit about superheroes in popular culture. All right, and so as um, Dr. Schabel alluded to as he went through kind of the injury history background, um, it's clear that we can see accidental injuries in all areas of our lives. And so when I was thinking about ways to study this topic for my thesis and dissertation, um, I was looking for topics I felt were really popular or really relevant, um, especially for younger children, as that's an age group I hope to work with in the future. And so superheroes are what came to mind for me because we're really seeing that superheroes are really um, kind of growing in popularity across popular culture and have been for many years. Um, but recently we're seeing a lot of statistics that show it's, it's one of the most popular genres, if not the most popular genre, really across the lifespan. So as young as the four and five year olds that I worked with and as old as adults. And so we know that they're really popular across all ages. And so that made it a really opportune topic to research. And so for the context of the research I'll be talking about today, I wanted to start by oper operationalizing what I mean by superheroes, because it can mean a few different things. And so for the research I worked on, we oper operationalize superheroes in the genre as individuals with superhuman powers. They use their powers for good and to encourage a just society, but they can also be reckless and risk takers. They're high in sensation seeking, high in benevolence, and often are impulsive. So when thinking about risk taking in the superhero genre, Really, we see it in the actual behaviors that superheroes engage in. So often when they're um, 
you know, you know, moving through either kind of fighting enemies or working to save people in the community, they're engaging in risky behavior. And this risky behavior is what we would also call fantastical or something a typical human would not be able to do. So it's risky behavior and something that a human wouldn't really be able to imitate. Um, and they're also making risky decisions and that relates to a lot of the impulsivity and kind of the risky decision making that we see. Um, yet at the same time, superheroes are considered role models in modern society. So if you go to a classroom in a school, often teachers are really encouraging kids to be superheroes because there's a lot of pro-social behaviors we think of with superheroes. They're um, brave, they look out for others, they're loyal. And so those aspects of superheroes really get played up as role models in our society. And then lastly, superheroes um, honestly are just very cool, right? They have cool costumes, they do cool things, they're very popular. Usually they're celebrated for all these, you know, behaviors and decisions that they make. Things typically turn out okay at the end of the show or movie. And so when kids see these types of characters celebrated in the way that they are and doing these cool things, it's likely then that they're going to identify with these characters. Um, and that may lead to some of the risk behavior that um, we're studying. And so this type of celebration of risk behavior or risky decision making is what we would call risk glorifying media. And we see this also with more adolescent um, genres, non-superhero related, so car chase video games or the way drinking might be portrayed in adolescent or teen movies and TV shows where there's some type of risk behavior being promoted in a glorifying way. And that type of approach to risky behavior, risky decision making may then lead to imitation of that risk behavior by the viewers. And so for the purpose of my thesis and my dissertation, we really classified superhero media as risk glorifying media because often the characters are engaging in risks and celebrated for the risks that they're taking. Um, however, what we are looking into in this research is whether or not with superhero media being risk glorifying, whether or not that may promote imitative risk taking during children's play and that could lead to injury. And so previous research more often actually looked at aggression and pro-social behavior less than this risk-taking side. So most of the research understandably for, for superhero content looks at whether or not kids and teens and adults are imitating aggressive behavior because there's a lot of violence and there's a lot of gore and aggression in superhero media as well as some of the risky pieces we're talking about. Similarly, there's a lot of that pro-social behavior as well. So saving others, doing good for the community, um, and, you know, engaging in this aggressive behavior for the, the, better, um, the better good for the group. And so most of the research really focuses more on that aggressive and pro-social behavior piece. And there's some evidence to show that there is some influence on superhero media exposure and those aggressive and pro-social behaviors. The most, re the most evidence really points to that aggressive piece more, more so than even the pro-social. So when thinking about my projects for my thesis and dissertation, I realized there was a major gap in looking at the risk taking behavior specifically. And so that's what I wanted to focus on um, for my projects. So the first project is my thesis. And um, my thesis is titled Your Friendly Neighborhood Super Kid, The Influence of Superheroes on Children's Risk Taking Behaviors. And so for my thesis, I was really focusing on that short term exposure of a superhero TV show, which um, was PJ Masks. And I'll kind of talk through some of the details of the project as well as the findings. So we were really asking the question, do children imitate and engage in risk taking in response to modeling risky behavior they view in superhero movies and shows? And do children imitate risk taking behavior and pro-social behavior following a short term exposure to superhero media? And we were able to recruit 59 children aged four to six years old and their caregivers. So the way we examined those questions were we randomly assigned um, the child participants to either a superhero or a control condition. And what that means and what that looks like was that half of the kids were in the superhero condition and watched a 13 minute episode of PJ Masks. And then the other half were assigned to watch a 13 minute episode of Caillou. So the way we chose those TV shows were based on kind of similar story arcs, similar engagement of the two um, types of um, 
like characters and plot lines going on. So that engagement was still kind of relevant and similar to both. But the content had to be very different in the sense that the control show we we chose um, should not have any type of superhero references or superhero components and um, no risk taking related to those superhero behaviors that we'd be looking at. And then we had every child engage in four main risk taking measures that I'll talk about in more detail. And then both caregivers and children completed some brief surveys on superhero knowledge, which looked like um, I would hold up a flashcard of a superhero and just say, do you know who this is? Um, what's their name? And if they could tell me the name of the superhero, then they knew that superhero. And then some questions related to media and superhero media exposure. How often are they watching superhero shows? Um, do they own any superhero pajamas or toys, things like that? And then lastly, a pro-social behavior scale, which got at pro-social behavior tendencies. So things like, um, would you help others in need? Would you help a stranger? Would you help a friend? Um, and that co covered the pro-social side of this project. So this is the picture sort task, one of our four behavior tasks. And so this involved showing pictures of kids doing risky things that looked like they'd be around the same age as the child participants. And we'd ask the child, would you do this, yes or no? And they would sort their answers into a yes box or a no box. And so we showed them 10 pictures with 10, behave, 10 descriptions. So this example would be a child really wants a toy. You, you're ready, getting ready to take a bath and you really want your toy on the shelf above the bathtub. Would you stand on the edge of the bathtub to get the toy? And they'd say yes or no and put that, sort that picture. And the more they said yes to, the more risky they were being in this task. Then we had vignettes and these are basically little stories. And so the stories explained a situation and then they had to choose an answer. And we knew on our end, the level of riskiness of their response. So the example I have here is you and your friends like to play tag during recess. One day your friend gets really close to catching you. You don't like to be it. So you really want to get away. What would you do to get away from your friend? Continue running even though you probably will get tagged run up the slide to avoid being tagged or just let your friend tag you since they're so close anyway. And then on the back end, we rated their answers and higher scores were, were riskier behaviors for this task. And then we had an activity room, which is literally a playroom that we set up and we had the kids play on their own for five minutes. We watched them through a mirror, um, a one-way mirror and recorded their behavior and then coded it afterwards and looked for specific behaviors that are considered risky. So things like jumping off the slide, um, climbing up the slide, um, running across the balance beam, things like that. And then lastly, we did the virtual reality pedestrian behavior task. And this is similar to, to what Dr. Schrabel was talking about earlier in the presentation. So we had the kids do the same thing and this was just a great way to capture another element of risky behavior that wasn't strictly play related. And so our main findings for my thesis were that risk taking and pro-social behaviors were not influenced by immediate superhero media exposure. And so really what that means is that children who watched PJ Masks took similar risks to children who watched Caillou. So we didn't see any major influence from that immediate exposure with the TV show. So across all those four behavior tasks I just mentioned, all risks were pretty similar. However, looking at more of those surveys and more of those questionnaires and talking with the kids and their caregivers, we did notice that lifetime exposure to superheroes and risk-taking behavior were actually more related. So getting more of kind of their background experiences, their exposures to the superhero media content, maybe their engagement in how much they liked superheroes or were playing with superhero toys, that's where we were seeing more of the relationships with risky behavior. So the next steps, um, led to my dissertation and our, our goals were to examine lifetime exposure to superhero media more carefully. So really start to better understand what that lifetime exposure looks like and how that might relate to risk taking, um, as well as consider what happens when a child pretends to be a superhero. So what I was really interested in with these findings was that play setting. And so seeing if a child is trying to be a superhero while playing, does that influence behavior more than what we're seeing here? And so that led to my dissertation, um, superhero media and risk taking, is superhero play a risk factor for unintentional injury in preschool age children? So staying with the same age group, but really focusing more on play 
And again, thinking more about that lifetime piece as well. So an overview for this study, we were asking the questions, how might risk behaviors present in superhero media promote imitative risk taking during children's play that could lead to injury? And are children more likely to take risks while pretending to be superheroes? Does identification with superheroes increase risky behavior, especially when pretending to be a superhero? Um, and when I say identification, I'll kind of talk through it in a little bit more detail, but that's where I'm really getting more at that lifetime piece, trying to dissect you know, what does lifetime exposure mean? Um, is it a kid who watches superhero shows every single day and loves superheroes? It's all over their, you know, toys and rooms. It's all they think about. Is it a kid who kind of sees it in passing and might have minimal exposure? Um, but for identification, we're really thinking about those kids who would love to pretend to be a superhero and play that way. That was kind of our goal for kind of getting at identification in this study. Um, and we were able to recruit 105 children aged four to six and their caregivers. Um, and I'll also add before going into the procedures, um, part of the reason of looking at these behaviors in preschoolers is because it is an age that they play pretend a lot. They're really starting to kind of get into more of this pretend play. And um, we know that this age group is really exposed to superhero media that varies. So we know they see things like PJ Masks, but we've also been there's a lot of data that shows they go to the live action movies that adults see all the time. So it seems like a good age group to really study this type of phenomenon in because we know they're exposed to such a wide variety of superhero content and behaviors. And so for this study, we randomly assigned them again to a superhero um, or control condition. And in this study, our control condition was a school condition. And so the superhero condition um, meant that a child pretended to be a superhero in an adventurous story protocol. So we actually had superhero costumes that they would put on. They would get to pick which one they wanted. Everybody had the same choices. Um, and they would wear that for the entire protocol. And we had a story that we basically walked through them, walked through with them um, to make them feel like they were superheroes. And they got to, you know, practice their super speed and practice flying and those types of things. Um, the school condition, on the other hand, they pretended to be a student in school. And it was a very similar story protocol. We just removed all of those risky superhero behaviors and instead had them like teach us their letters and their numbers and point out um, kind of the planets on a, on a map we had or on a solar system map that we had. So different things that made them more feel like they were in a school setting and they got to wear a backpack and pick out a pencil and a notebook um, that they got to carry with them throughout the protocol. And so for this um, project, we only had three behavior tasks. Two of them you've already seen. So I'm just going to introduce the third one, the ability test that's new. Um, and similarly to my thesis, we had a range of questionnaires. Um, but what you'll notice is we really focused on expanding the superhero piece in this study. So not only do we have knowledge, but we also have superhero exposure again. So looking at different types of shows and how often um, superhero engagement, which is looking more at how, um, like how many toys they might have, pajamas, clothing, um, identification, which is asking them actually, you know, who's your favorite superhero? How much would you like to be like them? And then imitation, which is asking questions like, do you imitate or do you fly like Superman when you're at home? And we actually asked these questions to both caregivers and children to get a um, kind of good variety of responses. As we do know, they're four and six, so we want to make sure we're getting a good range of answers. So the ability test, that third behavior task, is ultimately looking at their, the child's perceived ability to do um, a task. So there are three different tasks that we have. One is a reaching task where they're trying to reach a frog, a toy frog that's on a shelf. One is a stepping task where they're trying to step over um, a second stick that you can see in that middle picture. And the third one is a crouch task where um, they're supposed to crouch without putting their hand on the ground and try to reach that duck. So in the third picture, we see that she couldn't reach it, so she had to put her hand down. But ultimately, they get to try this at four different levels. Two, they can easily do. Two, they can't. And we ask them, do you think you can do this task? And 
if they say yes to the ones they can't do, that would be an indication that they're overestimating their ability. So those who are overestimating their ability, we considered a riskier decision. And you can parallel that to um, the way we conceptualize it is a child playing on the playground. They think that they could skip bars while doing monkey bars. They're overestimating their ability to do that. They might fall and hurt themselves. So that's the kind of comparison there we were looking at. So the main findings for this study were that trends suggested higher risk taking in the superhero condition. However, none of our findings were significant. So when you looked at the descriptive data, when you looked at the patterns, we did see that there were some trends showing that those who were pretending to be superheroes were um, taking more risks in those three behavior tasks. However, those differences between the two groups were not significant. So we have to keep that in mind when interpreting the results. Um, Second, trends demonstrated higher superhero identification was related to greater risk taking. And so to break that down, what that means is those who scored higher on those superhero identification questionnaires um, tended to take more risks across all behavior tasks than those who scored lower. Then that leads to our last point, which is those who um, were higher on superhero identification and were in the superhero condition um, was our hypothesis that those kids would take the most risks, right? Because they're getting that short-term exposure of pretending to be a superhero and they have that long-term exposure or long-term piece of superhero identification. We thought those kids would be the riskiest across all tasks. What we found was that sometimes that was the case, but not always. Um, superhero identification did seem to impact their risk taking, but that pattern was not always in the way we hypothesized. And so um, I'll talk a little bit about why some of those differences might have came out that way. So one theory is that um, the school condition we have um, might have impacted more than just a neutral control condition, not pretending to be anything. So for that ability task that I mentioned before, um, where we're looking to where we're looking to see if they're overestimating their abilities, you know, we're asking them, can you do this, yes or no? And often when kids are in a school setting, they're used to saying yes and trying their best and trying to impress and, and do what the teacher asks them to do. But in this case, saying yes hurt them from a risky perspective and made them appear more risky. And so thinking just about those two different groups might be an explanation for why some of those differences occurred for the ability test in particular. Um, then for the activity room, um, what we saw was that those kids who had higher identification with superheroes, they were just always taking the most risks. And so we didn't see much differences when we were looking across the groups because that higher superhero identification piece was already so high. So we're seeing some influence again of that superhero piece, but maybe not in the same way we'd expect when considering the short-term influence as well. So more of that long-term influence playing a role. Um, and then uh, we didn't see any differences in the picture sort task. And so that can be something to think about just as a measure and kind of future research of you know, approaching different methodology when working with preschoolers and kind of picking what works best for that age group. And so overall, when thinking about our patterns of what we found, um, to summarize what we found was that children's risk-taking behaviors may be slightly influenced by superhero pretense, so that short-term pretending, and somewhat influenced by identification with superheroes. So slightly influenced by that short-term piece um, and somewhat influenced by that longer-term piece. Um, and like I talked through, there might be some unique differences um, across each risk-taking outcome. And so that's especially helpful to think about when doing behavioral research because you're, um, especially when doing injury research, because you can only, we're simulating a lot of the outcomes that we're looking for because we can't really put these kids at risk. So we're trying to think of the best ways to um, represent risk-taking in the real world. And so future directions and takeaways for this research, um, like we talked about at the very beginning, injuries kill more children than anything else in our country. So this is a major public health concern and something that we're really trying to constantly learn more about. And psychologists have a role to, um, you know, engage in these behavioral research and behavioral interventions to improve those outcomes overall. 
And so for me, superhero media is a way I can kind of get in, involved and start doing this research myself. Superhero media is everywhere and we know that it does impact children's behavior. Um, and this is one way that we're starting to learn how it does so in the risk taking world. Um, superhero media might have some small impact on child risk taking. Um, we especially see this through long term exposure. And so it will be especially interesting to do research on this more longitudinally if we're able to follow these kids um, or if we're able to do it more observationally um, where we're seeing more of that real world kind of behavior and exposure to superhero media. Um, and then we see it somewhat through more of that short term viewing. So that PJ mask versus Caillou short term exposure. Um, and through pretending to be superheroes, so dressing up during play. And ultimately, these research findings can really help parents and inform public policy. Um, in particular, um, there's a lot you can learn um, and teach with parents regarding to risky play in general. So there's a lot of research ongoing about the best ways to facilitate risky play and in, in a safe way, so doing it in a way that's helpful and a great way to help the child grow and kind of learn those skills, but still maintaining an element of safety um, while applying the proper supervision, like we talked about earlier as well. And then more from the public policy side, thinking about media regulations um, and kind of considering what content this age group really is exposed to when it comes to superhero media specifically. And that's it for our presentation. So we're ready for any questions. Awesome. Uh, great information and just a fascinating study. And, and when I read about this, you know, the first thing that I had to do was get in touch with y'all to see if you'd be interested in doing a webinar because it was just so interesting. And with pop culture being a part of it, uh, jumping in right away with questions. Um, with one person, Karen says, did any of the children get injured during the ability test? Yeah, that's a great question. So nobody got injured during the ability test. However, one thing that we learned that, so the ability test was something that Dr. Fable had done himself um, a while before my dissertation. Um, and an unexpected difference that we didn't really think about um, was that when he did it, it was on carpets, but when we did it, it was on like the hard floor. And so for the stepping task in particular, when kids thought that they could do it, but couldn't, sometimes they would step on it on the second stick and it would kind of slide. So nobody got hurt, but kids definitely got um, scared. So you could tell that they got scared that it moved on them. Um, and then you notice kind of a different maybe hesitation or kind of reluctance to try it because, you know, like like most young kids, they kind of got startled and didn't really want to try it. So to yeah, I'll, to... I'll add a little bit more. Yeah. That that test was developed actually by my dissertation mentor in the in the mid nineteen nineties. It's been used probably in in five, six, seven hundred children over the over years, and and so no one's gotten hurt. It's certainly an ethical test. It's also consistently related to children's injury history. So the children that overestimate do tend to get hurt more. It's actually a really excellent measure of risk taking. Uh, and it's fascinating because it, it's something we do every day. Re can I reach this or not? Can I get across that intersection or not? We're judging distances and speeds and times in our everyday life. And children are learning that ability. And those children who tend to overestimate might sometimes get hurt a little more. I interrupted you though. Go ahead, Greg. No, no, that is by all means. I'm glad you, you said that. So this is just kind of a snapshot in time over the course of a few years. Superheroes have been around for a long period of time, Superman 1938, Batman 1939, Wonder Woman 1941, you know, the list goes on and on and on. Have you taken any kind of look to see if there's been a trend that's kind of changed over the course of time? Because when I was growing up in the 80s and 90s, superheroes aren't what they are today. Yeah, we had Superman, we had Batman, but now you have just a whole gamut. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. a great question. Go ahead, um, Casey. By trend, do you mean trend in the type of superheroes that are like present or the popularity of them? With the risk taking behavior, is there any correlation looking back over time? That's a good question. So um, honestly, with the dissertation, like background research I did, there's very little, if not really at all, um, research on this topic, on risk taking behavior with um, superheroes in kids specifically. There is some research um, that looks at maybe adult behavior for adults who grew up liking superheroes, but the risk behavior is more 
kind of generic. So more when you see kind of like maybe substance use or risky sexual behavior, things like that, less of kind of risky play behavior in kids. So I can't speak as much to change in trends for, for kids and risky play, just because it honestly has not really been looked at in depth. But there is some evidence that there's been um, like trends for those who grew up liking superheroes. Um, they do tend to engage in some risky decision making as adults. Out of the 100, 105 individuals that you had in the study, what was the makeup, boys and girls, and what were the differences? Yeah, that's a great question. So it it's at, it was actually about 50% boys and girls, and we did not see as much differences that we in, in gender that we expected when it came to risk taking, but there were some differences in their like superhero interests and exposure, which makes sense. Um, However, um, the, boy, the in boys general, having more exposure than the girls. Yes, boys have more exposure than the girls. Yes, um, and so we know that might influence their exposures in general. And part of that is there's just not as many, you know, girl superheroes too. Um, and when thinking about media exposure, it's bi-directional, and so kids are exposed to certain types of media and adults, but also those who. Um, have interest in certain type of media will seek it out more. So it kind of goes both ways. Um, and so there were some differences in terms of that exposure, but not in the risk taking. To what degree, if any, do you think the presence of friends affects risky behavior in this age group? For example, if you had a group of children instead of one on one, would the results be different? Yeah, yeah I good think we, that's a good question. And so um, I think from a risky play perspective, a lot of the literature for pretend play and kind of getting into that character, so thinking more of the identification side, um, comfort is a really big part of it. And so one area we were thinking of for why the pretense might not have led to as much risk taking is they're in a new setting, they don't know us, they're trying to get comfortable. And so I think if they're with friends specifically, um, that it could have led to more risk taking because there's a different level of comfort. They're engaging in kind of more behaviors as a group. Um, but if it was maybe a group of, you know, strangers, I think that like, you know, kids that they didn't know, I think that could be interesting to think about as well from that comfort and, and kind of shyness perspective. Yeah, maybe I'll just add a little bit there. There's, a, there's good research that peers influence children's behavior, including children's risk taking. Uh, that's probably most clear in adolescence. It's mm -hmm. somewhat clear in middle childhood. It's a little less clear in these young preschoolers. There's probably something there, but that's something that's going to change quite a bit with age. And for those of you who have children, depending on what age they are, as they get older, you're going to have more and more peer influence and a little less parent influence uh, in both positive and negative ways. I don't mean to make it all sound negative. It certainly encourages risk taking. But there's also research to suggest that if peers express caution, other peers will follow that caution as well. And, and so partly it's the group of friends that your children make and whether they're the risk taking group or the cautious group. Would there be any benefit? Or has there been any thought about taking this group of 105, three, five, six, seven, whatever years down the road and taking a look at this again? Wouldn't that be great? Yeah. Uh, it's expensive, so uh, not easy to do, but there is research like that. Uh, and, yeah. and it has been done, not this particular group of children, but um, it, that's the kind of research that's so powerful because it tells us so much about human behavior as children grow. There's a few very rare studies that study children from this age all the way into adulthood. And that gives us just so much information about, about human behavior. Uh, including human risk taking. Dr. Schwabel, you mentioned that your mentor had made up the, you know, kind of what you were studying, you know, 19, 20 years ago. What were you studying when the test was originally created? Yeah, so that's a great question. So I, I got my PhD in 2000 from the University of Iowa. So my mentor you designed this task in the, in the mid to late 1990s. Her name is Jody Plummer, and she is an expert in children's spatial development. So let me break that down. How do children children judge the space around them? And so she was very interested in how, in her first study, how six-year-olds, eight-year-olds, 10-year-olds, and adults, how often do they overestimate? And you can probably guess what she found, right? 
everyone overestimates. That's human nature to think we can do more than we can. But the adults did much less overestimation than the 10 year olds. The 10 year olds were better than the eight year olds and the eight year olds were better than the six year olds. Not a shock, right? What was more surprising to her is she had never done a lot of research on, on injuries. She was a, a child development expert. How do children grow? But in that first study, she asked parents, how many times has your child been to the emergency room? And she found what I told you that the kids who overestimated more got hurt more. Well, I went to a talk very similar to this one, although in the mid 1990s, it was not a webinar, it was in person and that won't surprise you. Uh, so I went to a talk about that research and as soon as she gave that talk, I went to her and said, you know, I'd like to do my dissertation on this research. And that led me to start using that estimation task to start studying injuries. Uh, and now 20, that's 25 years later, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of still at that game and, and still using uh, that, that task with Casey. So it's kind of fun to look back how that's evolved. Casey, any difference in the racial makeup of the study group? Yeah, so I, I saw that, so I looked quickly. And so our participants were 63% white and 94% non-Hispanic Latino. So the Hispanic Latino side, um, especially non-Hispanic, but um, is about 60% white, about 25% black, and then multiracial is kind of our next biggest group. But there were no difference, um, no significant racial differences in terms of the outcomes that we saw. How about siblings? Do you see the same concept in siblings? Yeah, great question. You know, kids, we didn't test that. So I'll let Casey answer, but I'm pretty sure we didn't test that. We do ask about birth order, but it, it's hard to kind of figure that out. Uh, and with, with blended families, it gets, it gets complicated from a scientific perspective. What do we know? We know that younger siblings are likely to be exposed to more superheroes, right? Because their older brother and sister are watching it. And they're also probably likely to be kind of egged on and try to catch up to the older siblings. So we certainly see effect of birth order if you take a traditional, you know, two-year-old, five-year-old, eight-year-old type family. In today's world, there's so much uh, blending, steps, siblings, and, and, and influences outside that scientists have to sort that out. But the basic premise is still there. And that exposure to superhero that, that, that Casey's research shows, it seems clear to me that you're gonna have more exposure if you've got older siblings in the home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would add that we did specifically ask about birth order and we asked about um, like, do siblings like superhero media and do parents like superhero media to get an idea of like, is this a family that loves superhero media or is it just this, this child or does nobody in this family like superhero media? So let me throw this at you. Are you guys into superhero media? I am. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> but okay. Casey led the research, so there you go. Yeah. <laughs> and Casey, do you gravitate Marvel or DC, or does it really matter? Um, I feel like I more recently, just based on the like shows and movies that are out right now, I gravitate towards Marvel. But I don't feel like I have a strong preference towards either. But I'm sure you have a favorite character. Yeah, I'm, I'm like most of America, which is actually a very common data point too. I'm. I like Spider-Man a lot, so. <laughs> yeah, Dr. Schwabel, how about you? I mean, growing up, I'm sure you had one. I, I'm i embarrassed to say I grew up a sheltered life. <laughs> I know very little about superheroes, but I still think it's important research and I recognize America's kids are exposed to this. I, I'm kind of surprised you didn't say Hawkeye, considering you're a Hawkeye, now a blazer, which well. I would love having you a part of the blazer family. <laughs> um, is there anything that you know parents can do to kind of curtail things and watch things a little closer? Casey, do you want to take that one? Yeah, so um, I would say some of that goes back to the supervision piece that we talked about just generally with injury prevention, which is that um, when thinking about supervising, um, you want to make sure you're, you know, for the for, in terms of like safety outcomes and being the safest kind of parent during supervision, you would you want to make sure you're engaging in active supervision, which means you're attending to your child, maybe engaging with your child, whether that be physically with them or watching them and talking to them while they're engaging in the task. And so, if you have a child who you know might be more prone to some of these like riskier play behaviors, like whether that be because of superheroes or whether just because you know your child's temperament and that's how they typically behave during play, then really focus on engaging in the active supervision when you can. So either being right there with them and kind of engaging with them or keeping kind of a watchful eye while they're while they're playing. 
Dr. If Sweeney. I can add, if I can yep. add one more piece, it's not appropriate to bubble wrap our children. Kids need to take risks. Kids need to try th new things. That's how they learn. And honestly, it doesn't hurt to watch some superhero media. I would recommend age-appropriate media. So we studied, uh, I'm blanking on the name now. Casey, what was the name of the super Y? No, super Y, was it? Uh, PJ Masks. PJ Masks. Okay, so those sorts of children's superhero shows are appropriate and probably healthier for children than watching adult-focused superhero media when they're preschoolers. The same with, with injury risks. At the playground, it's great for kids to climb and jump. That's how they grow. They're growing their muscles. They're growing their thinking skills. They're growing their, their, their ability, their social skills. So all that's as good. We supervise to make sure they're doing it safely. And we supervise the superheroes to make sure they're not exposed to too much of this risk taking, too much of this aggression, that the shows are, are appropriate for their age group. And as they go older, they're exposed to more. How much risk taking is too much? And maybe it's an open ended question because each person is going to be a little bit different. Yeah, no, it, it, it's tough to know. And it's tough as us for us parents to know. How much is too much if your child's in the emergency room? Well, you know, afterwards, that was probably too much, right? But it's hard to judge that. Uh, and, and uh, you know, as parents are busy and, and we got a lot going on and supervision isn't easy to do. Uh, what do I recommend? I recommend pushing your child some and, and reading your child's personality. You know, some kids are more risk, risk takers than others. Uh, both boys and girls, there's riskiness on both sides. Mm -hmm. Push them a little, but also help them learn when, gosh, I might have stepped too far. I'm going to step in. My child is doing too much. I'm going to step in. That wall is too high to balance on. Let's get down onto the sidewalk again, right, as one example. Last question, unless I get another one in the chat, is, you know, for more clarification, you talked about friends influencing the risk behavior. How about siblings? Yeah, we absolutely. A little bit on siblings, but expand on yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. Older siblings, uh, well, it goes both ways. The more common pattern is for older siblings to uh, encourage more risk taking in the younger sibling. I think that's going to be especially true with same sex siblings, but it happens across gender as well. Um, and of course, the age difference is going to be important. I, you know, what's the riskiest time? A year, two years, even three years? That's probably going to be higher risk because the younger one's trying to catch up. Their body might not be as big. So I, I love the image of jumping across a creek bed. I grew up in, in a neighborhood where there's a creek running through the neighborhood. And I, I'm a shorter person. I could not jump over that creek bed. But my friends did. Older siblings could. And so I would try and you don't make it and you fall. And in that case, you might twist an ankle and you might get wet. Uh, but if that it progresses to an injury situation, you can have negative consequences. Fantastic information. Great questions from the audience tonight. Dr. Schwebel Casey, thank you so much for being here tonight and taking time out of your busy schedules. Thanks. Thank you. Good to see you. You're everyone. so welcome. And just a reminder to everybody, a recording of tonight's webinar will be uploaded under our website tomorrow. As an attendee, you will receive an email with a replay link once it is ready. In a moment, I'll let you know what webinars we have coming up. But first, I'd love for you to join us for the 17th annual scholarship run presented by Viva Health. This year, register for our 5K, 10K, or virtual run. While we're in person at the Battery in Homewood, our virtual option allows you to run wherever you'd like or even sleep in while supporting scholarships, especially if you think it's too risky, right? Uh, register at alumni.uab.edu slash 5K, 10K. Meanwhile, come back and join us for other webinars on Tuesday, April 4th. Tune in to Healthy Eating Meets Healthy Activity for Busy Families. Dr. Doug Mollering will take a look at how we can balance our lives nutritionally despite being on the go. On Thursday, April 13th, a five-part series on youth sports will make its debut with Burnout in Youth Sports, while special, why specialization is not so special. We'll start the series with Dr. Kelvin Spellman as he gives us insight on in how sing, uh, singling out a sport can actually have an adverse effect on kids. On Thursday, May 4th, a couple of Potterheads will be with us for Mischief Managed, the way in which Harry Potter transfixed a generation. Ebony Harris and Jen Ivey will share how the Potterverse may not be what you think. And on Tuesday, May 23rd, our series on youth sports continues with brainstorming a deeper look into sports-related concussions. Dr. Sarah Gold, Dr. Heath Hale, and Dr. Kathy Weiss 
will join us as we look at why there are why there is so much concern for concussions. You can register for all of these and take a look at many other webinars we have coming up at alumni.uab.edu slash events. And before you go, we'd love to know your thoughts. How are we doing? What would you like to see? The QR code on your screen takes you to do a short survey. I encourage you to take a moment to give us feedback. Once again, thank you so much for joining us for tonight's webinar. And as always, go Blazers. Go Blazers. Thank you.